Welcome to the Ideas on Stage podcast, your regular insight into leadership communication. John, welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, John. As I told you in preparation for this conversation, for me, this is a huge pleasure and honor to have the possibility to have a chat with you because, as I told you, I've read Brain Rules many years ago, and it was one of the most powerful books I've, I've ever read. There are so many connections to our world at Ideas on Stage, let's say, let's call it communication, leadership communication. And I, for those, for our listeners, if they haven't read Brain Rules, now Brain Rules is a fascinating book around what, what science tells us about how our brain works. And there are many implications. One implication in particular, which is connected to this podcast is communication. Thanks to Brain Rules, thanks to this book, we know what science tells us about what works and what doesn't work when we want to communicate an idea. That's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, and I always say, when I work with clients, John, I always, I, I talk about you all the time. So <laughs> such a lovely way to start a podcast, Andrew. Thank you so much. Uh, I always, I always say, as Dr. John Medina says, as Dr. John Medina says, so those who know me know that uh, I've, I'm a big fan of your work. And I would like to start with a question around the, the problem, the, the communication mistakes. You say that one of the biggest communication mistakes is trying to communicate too much information. So if we think about the context of maybe giving a lecture to some students or giving a presentation, communicating an idea in general, can you tell us more about this big mistake that you see all the time, trying to communicate too much information? Sure. Well, there's probably two mistakes. The first one is people get bored, boring very quickly. But the second is the choke point, just to your point, that people tend to make too much, say too many things. There's a reason for that, I think. And there's actually, I think, even a, a resolution for it. The reason is if you are on the stage, you are often considered to be the expert. So you have this vast knowledge at your disposal. Your audience doesn't have a vast knowledge at their disposal. They only have a tiny little sliver, but it's easy, especially as you go through life as the expert, it's easy to, to misunderstand that and to start saying, okay, well then, uh, you know, they don't know, but here, I'll just throw all this stuff out all at once and somehow they're going to absorb it. And what ends up happening is that the expert uh, uh, pontificates too long with too much detail and watches the audience glaze over. And sometimes if they're a sensitive speaker, the speaker will notice that the audience is beginning to disengage and you know what I've seen a lot of speakers do they just pile on more information when the thing they needed to do was to be quiet to have more pauses to be able to pull back from the data and if possible at all particularly this day and age when possible provide an interactive platform as soon as you can so you can speak for a little while say a few things then stop and see if the how the audience is responding I sort of think of it like eating you know, you put a, a fork full of, of food in your mouth and then you chew it and then you swallow it and then you take another fork full. The equivalent of being a bad speaker is to take one more fork full, now, now another one, now another one, now another one, and pretty soon your mouth is too full and yeah, you're pretty illegible. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great analogy. And what you've described, John, is I don't know if this is something I've learned from you. Maybe, maybe that's the case. You, you'll tell me. It, it's the, the, the curse of knowledge, right? That often we know so much about a subject and, and also we are so close to it that we think that everything is important. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and so we think that we need to communicate everything. Is, isn't that true? Yeah. Or you also think that because you are jazzed by it and excited by it, that somehow your audience is going to be too. Uh, in, in certain communications, occasionally I'll give lectures to our junior faculty that come in, and the first thing I'll say to them, remember this, what is obvious to you is obvious to you and to no one else. The gadget that needs to be employed, I think, 
when speakers are wanting or, or a lecturer is trying to learn is a gadget we call theory of mind. Theory of mind has two components to it. And there's a brain science behind this, which is why uh, you've asked me to speak a little bit about brain. So here we go. The uh, uh, theory of mind is the ability to penetrate inside someone else's psychological interior and with very little cueing, understand the rewards and punishment systems inside that interior. It's as close to mind reading as the brain gets. To have really good theory of mind, you can't be very self-centered because if you're penetrating inside somebody else's head, the second gadget of theory of mind is just what I said. You realize at all times that the rewards and punishment systems and backgrounds and experiences of the person you're looking at is not the same as you, yours is, but they're not gonna react like you because you're not the center of the universe, okay? <laughs> you're certainly not the center of their universe. So the idea of what is obvious to you is obvious to you. In order to be an effective communicator, one of the most important uh, uh, personal traits you can get is to learn not to be self-centered. Yeah. Is to learn to think that uh, in terms of what the other audience's uh, reactions are to you and be as sensitive to that as you can. Yeah, one of the, the first things we always do when we work with our clients is let, let's say that somebody needs to create a presentation or give a speech. We always start with the audience instead of thinking about PowerPoint or even your message. Your message depends on the audience and, and what they need. Yeah. I think that when we give a presentation or a lecture, it's, it's their presentation, it's the audience's presentation, not ours. And John, before you used a word, which is boring, you said if we don't get it right, then it can be boring. Now, in your work, you say that a brain doesn't pay attention to boring things. And I love, can you tell us more about what, what happens? What do you mean by the brain doesn't pay attention to boring things? Sure. Well, we can start by perhaps working on the positive side of that. What does the brain pay attention to? And what the brain pays attention to is three things, maybe four things. And in roughly a Darwinian order, when a piece of information comes into your head, the first question the brain asks is, will it eat me? <laughs> it's an assessment of threat. Can I eat it? The brain is, is only 3% of your body weight, but it's 20% of, of the energy that you consume goes right up to it. So it's an energy sink. It's an energy hog. So it's looking for energy resources. And anybody that's ever seen a commercial at 10 o'clock at night knows that it's filled with fast food because we lock onto it at that time because, you know, dinner was four hours ago, unless you're my relative from Spain in which dinner was yesterday, it was an hour ago. But for most, it's they're hungry again and they want to get at it. So will it eat me? Can I eat it? It's the first question that it asks. The second question is also Darwinian and the whole reason why you want to survive, to project your genes to the next generation. So can I have sex with it? Will it have sex with me is a high priority. It's a big deal. And as, as again, advertisers often know that if you can appeal to particularly a, a component of sexuality we call appetitive sexuality, which is the arousal component of sex, then the brain pays attention to it. Um, Questions, that, so that's questions three and four. Will it have sex with me? Can I have sex with it? Questions number five and six to me are the most interesting because they're professionally, because there's no a priori for them and it's barely Darwinian, but you can show it empirically. Uh, question five is, have I seen it before? Question six is, have I never seen it before? It turns out we pay a ton of attention to pattern matching. If you can imagine, if you're in a jungle and you saw a tiger with only half a face, can you visualize that for a second? You've never seen that before. What is your brain gonna do? It's gonna lock down on that. Oh my gosh, I've never seen that before. Or if the tiger is growling at you and about ready to jump on you, by God, you have seen it before and you can pattern match off of it. And it is also just nearly as strong as threats and, and sex with the idea of being, we have a survival strategy that's built around prior experience. These days I'm tempted, Andrea, to add a fourth. And that fourth one is, is there a narrative or not? It turns out the brain pays tons of attention to narrative information. If, you, if, it, if it can detect that it's a narrative, the brain will actually light up with that theory of mind stuff we were just talking about called the mentalizing network. Here's a great example. This is an experiment you can do that uh, if you want to get the brain to really lock down and pay attention, to light up as if it was 
I don't know, the United States that would be the 4th of July fireworks, whatever, whatever uh, equivalent of that is for celebration, uh, the end of a Disneyland experience. Okay, fireworks. Here's how you keep the brain bored. The king died and then the queen died. It's the old E.M. Forster uh, idea of how to, how to make a story. If you just say that and somebody's under imaging equipment, the king died and then the queen died. The brain is ready to go to sleep. There's nothing interesting about it. You're about ready to get bored. But if you add two words to the end of that sentence, you can make the brain light up like the end of Disneyland or the United States 4th of July. Here are the two words you add at the end. The king died and then the queen died of grief. Of grief is the magic two words that makes the mentalizing network just light up. Why? Couple of reasons. One of the biggest is it's detecting a narrative. Before you just had a declarative sentence, the king died and then the queen died. But if you add grief, of grief, now you have an insight into the relationship between that king and that queen. And you have a relationship between the intensity of, that, uh, uh, of their relationship, which means you're inaugurating the theory of mind. So I would add a fourth. If the first is threat, the second is sex, the third is pattern matching, and all the questions that are around there, have you a narrative that you could share with your audience is one of the pure, uh, uh, purest, fastest ways to keep them from being bored. Yeah, and uh, narrative. And that's why it, it's so interesting to understand why, for example, now we all know that when we communicate an idea, it's very useful to include, to illustrate the idea with stories, examples, anecdotes. So let's say narrative in general, it's so useful to understand why that works from a scientific perspective. Sure. And now we said that, so we, we started talking about getting the audience's attention and keeping it high. Yes. One of the very useful tips, practical tips that I've learned from you, John, is the I call it now the 10 minute rule. I don't know whether you call it the 10 minute rule, but the idea that, again, you will be able to explain it better than me. But if we look at how our brain works, when we communicate an idea during a presentation, during a lecture, after about 10 minutes, we know that the audience's attention drops. And so as communicators, we know that after about 10 minutes, we need to do something. To, to, to buy the audience's attention back. Can you tell us more about what's going on here if you think about this 10 minute rule? Well, first of all, we don't understand why it's 10 minutes, <laughs> but it does hold up pretty well. Bill McKeechee, he's dead now at the University of Michigan, was the first guy to really put this together. And in fact, it's sometimes called the McKeechee 10 minute rule. But he noticed that after about 10 minutes, students, uh, and they would self-report at first, started waning in their attention. And so he called it the 10 minute rule. That recently got some support in 2018, published in the journal of all places, Andrea, Nature. <laughs> Ewers et al. did another study asking the question, well, McKeechee did his work in 1999. It, what is, how does it hold up in the 2018 world? It's a digital generation. There's a lot more attention spans issue. Does the 10 minute rule still hold up when you're giving a lecture? And the answer is, you bet it does. In fact, it's 11 minutes and 45 seconds, <laughs> which is why it probably got into nature. He also was able to give a rate. If you do, if, if you, you have 11 minutes before you start losing the audience, if you've gone two minutes more so that it's now 13 minutes, at, that's usually the point of no return. You might as well get off the podium and not work anymore because uh, uh, every 70 seconds, the amount of boredom that viewers measured increased, it actually doubled. So it continued to, by the time, oh, I don't know, another two minutes have gone by, if you do the math, you've essentially lost your audience. So it appears that the 10 minute rule, we do not understand why it's 10 minutes, but it seems to hold up in the decades, at least in both these experiments were done in Europe and in North America, uh, and in a pre-digital world and in a digital soaked world, still the same thing was available. So, 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 sorry, because sorry to cut you off, but, but does that mean, does that mean that in your experience, if you think about what happened in the last couple of years with COVID and everything, so most communication is happening, things are changing, but a lot of communication is happening online at the moment. Okay. So do you not see any difference at all in terms of audience's attention dropping maybe a bit faster online? What's your experience there? It seems to be worse 
And the bottom line will be get back to in-person as soon as you can. Now, let me unpack that a little because I just said a really big thing. Um, in the meeting that we're having, we're, we're over Zoom right now. The, uh, there is something called Zoom fatigue, which you're probably familiar with. But uh, uh, Baylitz and, Ed, and others at Stanford have really tried to un unpack why it is that Zoom meetings can be so exhausting. And there may be a couple of reasons why. In fact, there may be three reasons. Here's the first one. Have you ever heard of the big head or big face problem? Have you ever heard that before? Uh, stop me now. The, uh, um, okay, it's called the big head or big face problem. In the Serengeti and on the, uh, on the, on the slopes of the Ngorongoro crater where we grew up evolutionarily, the only time we ever saw a big face was when we were about to engage in physical combat or we were having sex. Okay, so when you see a big face, the brain gets gets trained. Oh, it's a big face. I'm either going to die or I have the best time of my life. Either are available with big faces. With a Zoom call, you see a big face. So what is the poor brain supposed to do? Well, what it does is that it says, from an evolutionary perspective, this is usually a high valence uh, uh, interaction, but it's a freaking Zoom call. So I have to continually bat away that natural instinct so that I can continue on with the Zoom call. That's called the big face problem because it's exhausting. The brain's already, as I said, the brain's already taken 20% of your metabolizable glucose. But when it comes time to a Zoom meeting, trying to bat away the instincts of a big face is a, is a big deal. Here's a second reason. Um, it has to do with eye contact, which as you know, if you're a mammal, is a big old deal. And it's been measured with humans actually pretty well. Um, uh, if you avert from somebody's gaze, if somebody you lock gazes with somebody and then you avert your eyes within 1.2 seconds, usually you think the person is ignoring you. <laughs> so I'm staring at you right at the, at the camera right now, Andrea. Now I'm not going to, now I'm gonna stare down here. But if I don't uh, pull up the camera in about, oh no, 1.2 seconds, you're gonna think I'm ignoring you. Oh, there I am. If I stare too long at you in real life in an in-person interaction, too long is 3.2 seconds. It's not much. But if I stare at you for three seconds and not say anything, so I'm going to stare at you for three seconds, Andrew. Here I go. You begin to get creeped out because it's not normal. In a Zoom call, if you're not looking directly at the camera, you could be off camera for a whole long time. Or if you are constantly flitting around and you don't have a lot of good hygiene and you don't remember to look specifically and interact as if it were a person, i.e. that's some acting chops, uh, your brain is constantly having to bat away the fact that, yeah, this is artificial, but it's okay. It's okay. We still have to have the Zoom call. And there's the second of the three reasons why it's exhausting. The third reason why it's so exhausting is because I cannot see and you cannot see my entire body. If I were to stand up all of a sudden and move around like I normally do in lecture, blocking certain places and addressing maybe uh, one part of the audience just so that the others will pay attention to me. And the kids, I teach second year medical students and actually mostly bioengineering graduate students. The, uh, 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 and then if I don't come back to them, they can ignore. But in all cases, I, they can see my entire body language. In a Zoom call, you can't see very much. What, how I've tried to defeat it is that I purposely put, you'll notice that this is a three quarter shot you can see down here. And I make sure that the shirt or whatever it is I'm wearing is dark so you can see my hands. The hands will then pop. And then I can still have some of the verbal and nonverbal interactions that are occurring. All three of those, whether you're looking at the big face or you're looking at uh, eye, eye contact or you're looking at nonverbal verbal communication is so exhausting to the brain that it makes perfect sense to me that Zoom fatigue is a thing. And indeed, my suggestion to the, to the world at large, it's so exhausting that you shouldn't have tons of Zoom meetings. Maybe 45 minutes and then go have a phone call if you have to still have a meeting. And then maybe come back onto it a little later and then go off so that you're dovetailing it back and forth. That is a really long-winded answer to your question. The real answer is get back to in-person as soon as you possibly can. We, for millions of years, particularly the last 200,000, that's what we were used to. Yeah. And John, let's go back again to the 10-minute rule. Can you give us some examples of what you do I know that, for example, you divide your lectures into 10-minute segments. Right? And that, again, the context could be a lecture, it could be a presentation. Yeah. Let's say that somebody now wants to implement this 10-minute principle into their presentations. Can you give us some examples? What can we do 
after about 10 minutes. Sure. Uh, let's say that you're already 10 minutes because there's some things you should probably do in the introduction also, but let's, let's, that's a whole different conversation. So, okay, you're 10 minutes into a, a, a dry talk. You're just going to give a lecture. It's not particularly interesting. At the nine minute and 59 second mark, get paranoid because you're about to lose your audience or the 11 minute 45 second mark. You're about to lose your audience. So you have to do something. What do you have to do? You have to insert at the nine minute and 59 second mark, what we call an emotionally competent stimulus, an ECS. An emotionally competent stimulus is addressing one of those six questions that we just described. Threat, non-threat, food resource, sex, uh, sexual availability, pattern matching, not pattern matching, and maybe you could also include narrative. If you put something in there at the nine minute and 59 second mark, you can buy another 10 minutes of attention for some, somebody's audience. I'll show you an example. Because I work a lot with mental health issues, and my particular, my particular expertise is the molecular biology of psychiatric disorders. So psychi there's a lot of things you can say about psychiatric disorders. There's also a lot of things you can say about how the brain processes information normally. So if I'm going to give a lecture, say, on how the field of view is, uh, uh, is apprehended by the brain, I'll start out or how, how visual perception works, which is something I lecture on occasionally. Um, I will not start out saying, well, here's two hemifields and then something called the lateral geniculate nucleus, and now we're going to push it back to V1A in the occipital and there's bottom up and top down. Pro no way. <laughs> I, will, I can watch my audience just sail away, even though they're, you know, they're bioengineering graduate students, they're science competent, they would want to stay with me. No. I'll start it out with this one. I'll start it out with a case history of uh, uh, Oliver Sacks uh, talks about a story about Mrs. S. Mrs. S has suffered a stroke and has had an extraordinary thing happen to her as a result. Mrs. S can now only see half of her world. She can only see the right half of her world. She cannot see the left half and she only can see the right half and she thinks the whole right half is her field of view. She only puts makeup on the right half of her face, the right? Uh, take a bilateral symmetry and put it right down. Only half of the face only puts eye makeup on the right eye. She only eats from the left half of her plate. In fact, one of the ways this was noticed is that she felt like the people that were giving her the food were starving her because she'd only eat from the right half and then she'd think that was it. So what they learned to do, <laughs> they learned to just turn the plate. <laughs> So Mrs. S continually saw magic food appear in her field of view. Now, Andrea, do I have your attention? If I have your attention, that's, there's a mild threat in there. There's a little bit of humor. So maybe that's going to tickle parts of the dopamine, oxytocin, sex, uh, endorphin part. Something that would be there. Now, after I finish with Mrs. S and we've had a good laugh, now I can start talking about hemifields and the lateral geniculate nucleus and V1A and bottom up and top down processing uh, uh, um, as a way for about mm, nine minutes more. So those, that, those are called emotionally competent stimuli and you sprinkle them throughout. We, if you have to give a 50 minute lecture, 5-0, you should never give a 50 minute lecture. You should give five 10 minute lectures and, and, and cement each joint with, a, with uh, an emotionally competent stimulus. Yeah. Now, there are certain specific rules that you have to follow to do an emotionally competent stimulus. You can't just crack a joke, for example. The, uh, uh, in fact, if you're, if, you're trying to if you're trying to deliver expository information, humor can only be used under certain circumstances, in my view. It, it can be used greatly. But here are the, uh, the three rules. First of all, it should be short because you're not there to entertain them. If you want to entertain somebody, go see a movie. If you, want to, if you want to listen to a lecture, then you're in a lecture. I don't consider lecture entertainment, uh, but it doesn't have to be boring. Okay. Uh, number two, it should be short. Number two, it needs to be relevant so that you can either summarize what you just said from the previous 10 minutes or introduce, I actually think introductions work a little better, uh, introduce uh, 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 for, the next, for the next set so that it stays uh, relevant in particular. And thirdly, it should be bespoke. You should, de you should tailor whatever it is that you're saying to your audience specifically. For example, if I am talking to a bunch of graduate students and they're now in their 20s, and I immediately talk about ABBA and the comedian Jack Benny, <laughs> they, they, they may know Eurovision, maybe you know a history of ABBA from way back when. Who is Jack Benny again? 
all that stuff, you have to tailor continually your hooks to the audiences that you're looking at. So it needs to be short, it needs to be relevant, and it needs to be tailored. I guess that goes, the, the, the last point you mentioned, tailored, it goes back to theory of mind, right? Yes, absolutely. Communicating something, putting ourselves in the audience's shoes. John, another thing which I find very interesting in your work, in your research, is that you say that the brain processes meaning before detail yes. which which and so that means that if you want people to to pay attention then you shouldn't start your lecture your presentation with details first you should give them the big picture and then you can move on to the details yeah is, yeah. is that is that correct that's correct meaning you want to always start when you can with the forty thousand foot view and then bring it down to the small details. You should never start with the details and then try and make uh, people make sense of it. Bad speeches look like mosaics. where you are just putting down little pieces and then hopefully someone else will define the view. No, Bit good speeches start out with giant swaths of Picasso where you're just making these giant uh, 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 signatures and then moving back down. You can actually show that learning is much more efficient if you follow a hierarchical heuristic that way. The, and the best way to start the hierarchy is to continually talk about the meaning of what you're going to say before you start to talk about the detail. For example, if we go back to Mrs. S who could only see one half of her plate, that's meaningful. She is debilitated for the rest of her life. I'll give another example, if that's okay. The, uh, uh, um, uh, of, there is an area of the brain that processes motion, anything. If it's moving, your brain's gonna process it. The, uh, you can get a stroke in that area and suffer from a, an extraordinary experience. You can no longer see things that are moving. It's called akinetopsia. You can no longer see things that are moving. If you are uh, uh, crossing the street and there's a car coming at you, you do not perceive the car coming at you. You perceive a, a, a processive, almost strobe-like set of snapshots of a car getting bigger, but you can in no way line up the cells as if it were an animation and then run, and then run the movie. From that, that is really, really interesting. It's also life-threatening to some people. Now I can talk about the areas of the brain that are involved in echinotopsia because I gave the meaning of the disorder before I talked about the neurology of the disorder. And that's what I mean. Yeah, I love it. And John, so far we talked about capturing the audience's attention, keeping it high. Let's also talk about memory, short-term memory, because not only do we want our audience to pay attention to our ideas, we also want them to remember what, what we told them. And one of the things I know you do is you include repeat, in, in addition to, of course, telling your students at the beginning of a class what the plan is, what you're going to cover, right. but you also include some moments where you, you, you include some repetitions of where we are throughout the hour, for example. For our listeners today, can you tell us more about, first of all, what, what kind of repetitions are we talking about? And, and again, why is this so useful in communication? Sure. Well, let's start with how a little bit about how memory works and then move specifically to how you can capture parts of it in the, uh, in the classroom. Uh, the first thing I need to say, though, is that uh, is, is really easy because we have no idea how memory works. <laughs> we don't know. There are 30 separate, maybe 40, 30 or 40 separate memory gadgets in your brain that all cover different things and follow different rules. For example, the where you remember that Berlusconi was the uh, prime minister, was he prime minister, president, whatever the, uh, the head of the, of the prime class. minister. Yeah, prime minister. If he was the prime minister, that's a declarative piece of information. That piece of information is different, uh, is stored in a different place and follows different rules than your ability to remember how to ride a bicycle. And both of those are stored in a different place than remembering that if I put my hand on a hot stove, that hand is going to get burnt. So I better not have a hot stove. Those are all different. And that, those are only three. So in fortunately for teaching, one large domain of information is called declarative information. And we know something about the rules of declarative. So from now on, I will talk to you about, I'm going to narrow it down to one thirtieth of what's out there. 
<laughs> and talk about a, a, a memory gadget, declarative memory gadget. What do we know about it? Well, if we follow the Larry Squire, Eric Kandel model, which is what I'm going to do here, followed by a healthy dose of a guy named Alan Badley, who is uh, uh, just about oh, 200 kilometers north of London now, the, uh, 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 the gifted scientist. Here is the following. You have something Larry Squires calls immediate memory. It can hold seven pieces of information for about 30 seconds. It's the famous 1959 seven pieces plus or minus two that you get, but that's actually fairly, you can hold seven pieces of declarative information in your head, say a list of words for about 30 seconds. These are things you can declare these words. If you don't repeat it within 30 seconds, you can kiss it goodbye. And here we follow, find the first great principle of memory. And that is this, human learning, human memory is actually controlled forgetting. And it's important to really understand that that's a reversed. We often think of it as how to make it stick. And the real answer is how do we keep it from being flushed down the toilet? <laughs> that's the best. Okay, if you do repeat the information in 30 seconds or so, the brain removes it from immediate memory and goes into what I like to call Alan Badley land. It used to be called short-term memory, better to call it working memory. Working memory is the same thing as short-term. This is a short-term memory buffer that has a fairly large capacity. It has a much larger capacity than seven pieces of information. In fact, different people's memories are, uh, that's probably where we get people's IQs from, at least in part. It turns out that some people have really good temporary memories. I'm not even sure what IQ is. IQ, I think, measures your ability to take an IQ test, but we differ. The, uh, back to the working memory. Now, now, if a piece of information was repeated, it'll now hold for about two hours. But if you don't repeat it again, within two hours, the brain is going to flush it down the toilet, this controlled forgetting idea, which suggests something extraordinarily powerful. If I'm going to say you can only hold uh, uh, seven pieces of information for 30 seconds, do you see what I just did? I just repeated that. Hopefully I got it within a short period of time. Then I'm going to say Alan Badley, 200 kilometers north of London. There, I repeated it again. Now you can store that in, a, uh, in memory for a, a period of time. In lecture, I've, I do that deliberately, but I've seen really good teachers just do it naturally. They seem to have a feel for their audiences. So there's a constant sense of repetition. From a broadcast perspective, if you ever want to get a really good example of somebody who repeats over and over again without getting boring, boring watch, uh, it's a show on MSNBC called The Rachel Maddow Show. And when she's busy uh, talking about the declarative expository information, she just repeats all the time. It's a masterclass in it, in my view. And naturally, good teachers have the ability to do that. Um, so how can you do that in lecture? Well, first of all, let's get depressed. Because if you've only got 50 minutes for the, with the kids, if you're a college professor, you know, homework when they, get, when they get down eight hours later is not review of your great ideas. It's actually new learning. So it suggests to me that you should have a system. If you have to give a multi-hour lecture uh, seminar, for example, the best thing you can do is to repeat every two hours everything you just said. It can be in condensed form. It can be, it doesn't have to be, uh, uh, it certainly shouldn't be boring. But what it will end up being is that your, your audience will look at you and will say, oh, thanks, I had forgotten that. And by God, you repeated it. And feelings of safety emanate from them. And those get right onto you. And even if you're not a very safe individual, they think you will be. <laughs> In which case, they, you start to develop this extraordinary relationship with your audience. If you don't repeat it, if you speak as fast as I do, and I know I speak at the speed of light, the only way I can get the audiences to stay with me, or in this particular case, the kids, my students, to stay with me, is that I'm constantly repeating. I'll repeat it in 30 seconds. You know, Alan Badley, 200 kilometers north of London. It's, it's, it's working memory. It used to be called short-term memory. You know that? And it's seven pieces. You know, Andrea, how long can you hold seven pieces of information for? And you'll go, 30 seconds, John. Will you shut up? When you get to the point where the audience is almost pushing back on you a little bit, you actually won. <laughs> From a, from a memory perspective, that, so, so we, we know then that repetition is good in communication. It's also good, not just for the audience, but for the presenter, the, the professor, the, the communicator himself or herself. You say in the book also, that's another practical tip for our listeners, that, for example, if you have a test in a week's time, yes. then 
and you want let's say that you you can you've got time to repeat it yeah ten, 10 times you can go through the material about 10 times then instead of doing it all together on the same day at the end it's yeah. better to spread it out over more days Right. Does that so does that apply? I, I assume, John, that this applies to the context of giving a presentation. So let's say that somebody needs to give a presentation in a few days, in a few weeks, then can we say that from a scientific perspective, it, it's better to rehearse that presentation, not all together, maybe we rehearse it three or five times at the end on the same day, it's better to spread it out. Is that correct? I think that is a logical extrapolation of the data that actually didn't measure presentation practice, but actual pieces of information that you were going to get regurgitate on the test. But I think the, the, uh, the, the mechanisms are exactly the same. So it's reasonable to project. Let's go with the data. This was done with Wagner et al. Uh, he used to be, a, uh, I think, a graduate student in Dan Schachter's laboratory, who's the kind of the forget memory uh, guru. He's at Harvard. And what he was able to show was just what you said. If you have to take a test on Friday, the week before the test, you should be looking at the information every day for maybe an hour and then leave it alone. It's called interleaved learning. So you look at it for a little bit, then leave it alone. Now on Sunday, look at it, leave it alone. On Monday, look at it, leave it alone. If you only have 10 times, don't do all 10 times on Thursday, the day before the test. That's a train wreck. Brain isn't learning very much of anything. It's actually just uh, storing it enough to be able to repeat certain pieces of information. Wagner et al. were able to show that it's much better if you interleaved it. So I think you can say if part of presentation is learning something so that they, so that the, your client feels so comfortable with the knowledge that they no longer have to think about it and they can focus on the audience, because I know that that's a big deal for a lot of speakers. They're really freaked out uh, but, and paying attention to the audience is almost the last thing on their mind. They want to make sure their fly is up. <laughs> I totally understand that, uh, where, that, where that is. But if you want to get them so that they can use their theory of mind to see how they're coming across, and thus in an iterative way perhaps change, adapt to the speaking uh, uh, experience while it's happening, it's better to practice it 10 times once per day uh, for a week or for 10 days before you actually have to give it. I think that's a logical extrapolation. Perfect. Perfect. Good to know. So, John, so far we looked at attention gaining getting the audience's attention we talked about memory now now there is another super interesting insight that that you shared in the book which is around sensory integration you say that when we communicate an idea we should stimulate more of the senses now as humans we have five senses right or six or eight <laughs> six or eight yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it's 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 kind of in the state of flux. Has been for a long time, by the way. Okay. <laughs> so five five is the bare minimum. Six probably. Okay, five six senses and and we can repeat that within thirty seconds so that we remember that. <laughs> <laughs> and and you, you say that what we really should do is we should be able to create multi sensory lectures presentations let's say communication in general yeah. can you tell us more about this what do you mean by i think it's so important in communication creating multi-sensory experiences for the audience sure well let's start with the brain science well we'll actually start, well actually let's we'll, we'll do the the big brain science and then move into the details of it um the big brain science here once again comes from our evolutionary history when we got out into the Serengeti, we, we didn't say, oh, I'm going to turn off all, I'll turn off four of my five senses. Say there's five senses. I'll turn off four of them and just focus on the visual today. So you're going to walk around all day with your, with your hand on your ears and you're not going to eat anything or smell anything. You're not going to feel anything. No. Or wake up the next morning and say, I know, I did vision yesterday. Today I'll do auditory. So I'm going to close my eyes and stop up everything and just hear. No. Our experience in the evolutionary uh, uh, breadbasket of the Serengeti and the Ngorongoro crater was that we were multi-sensory all the time. We saw, tasted, smelled, heard things simultaneously a lot. In fact, we so want that to be an integrated phenomenon that we that uh, theaters could actually fool us really easily uh, simply by uh, because we want to uh, uh, have a multi-sensory experience if we can. For example, when you go into a theater 
and you ask the question, is the big face, talk about a big face, if the big face is on the screen is actually saying the words, you actually think it's the actor or the actress actually saying the words. In modern theaters, no. The vocal, the vocal frequencies are usually coming from the side panels, the side speakers, not the, the things in the back of the, of the screen is usually a subwoofer or some large uh, a piece of infra, uh, large auditory equipment that's not related to speech. No, the speech is on the side. Yet, nobody ever sees, when you see somebody speaking on a theater, goes, oh, look at that. No, it's considered integrated. It's considered multi, and so you make, you do that with smell, you do that with taste, you do that with feeling, you do that with auditory, and you do that with vision. Okay, so that's the big, that's the 40,000 foot view. If we start to, can, is that capturable? Should we capture it in a classroom would be the next question. So if we get a little more detail, the answer is, yeah. The more senses you can stimulate at the moment of learning, the more robust the retrieval will be. The less senses you stimulate at the moment of learning, the less robust the retrieval will be. The reason why, if you're a computer programmer, you would know the idea of pointers. But the whole idea is, is to put pointers all up and down a particular information tree and ask questions of how many ways can I access it. The more senses you stimulate, the more likely you are to be able to access it. In fact, we have a hierarchy of access points. Even though half the brain is devoted to vision, if you can smell something, your brain will just lock down on it. Smell is a ridiculously powerful uh, attention-getting device with us, but it's built to integrate all around. So the more senses you can stimulate at the moment of learning, the more robust the learning is likely to be. Now, to even more detail, let's get right down onto the ground of the classroom or with the presentation. What senses do we use? The answer is two freaking senses. And the rest of the brain is going, you know, there's more to life than auditory and visual. Yet the only thing you're giving me is auditory and visual. So if you don't give me an emotionally competent stimulus in 10 minutes, I am out of here. Because a classroom and a presentation is an artificial environment. And there's the hallmark of it, the hallmark. So if there were a way to get smell-o-vision and taste-o-vision and sensory, uh, maybe a haptic response of some kind, so that you were beginning to recreate it, the, the logical conclusion, Andrea, is that the most effective classroom in the world is the holodeck of Star Trek Next Generation whereby all the senses are stimulated all at once. That would be the way to teach. Could you, because I think this will be useful for our listeners, could you give us a, an example of how to, in a classroom or in a presentation, how somebody could, could stimulate more of, the, more of the senses, more than just the one or two senses that we often stimulate in a scenario like that? I have no idea. <laughs> Sorry, I can tell you something that I did just to see if the experiment would work. Uh, uh, um, and, and it worked like son of a gun. Oh my gosh. So the answer is I don't know. So that's the real answer. The, uh, but this is what I did. There is a, uh, in, in the United States, there is this really cheap perfume called Brute, B-R-U-T. And it's got a really specific, no one's allergic to that I'm aware of, at least they weren't when I did this experiment, because I did this experiment. Better to say anecdotal manipulation of the classroom. Every time, and I did this over two successive semesters, one, one with and one without, uh, um, every time I talked about a particular enzyme, I was talking about a transcription factor called RNA polymerase II. Okay, so it's a very specific thing to talk about. How does a gene get read and turn into an, uh, in, turn into an mRNA, which we're all familiar with with vaccines now, mRNA. The, uh, uh, there's something that makes mRNA inside a cell. RNA polymerase II is its name. Every time I said that word, I took a little brute and just sprayed it in the class. <laughs> so for the entire unit, just sprayed a little bit in the class so that they were constantly pairing RNA polymerase II with the smell. And then at test time, I either sprayed or did not spray to see what their recall was like. Yeah. And it's anecdotal. I didn't publish it. This is not. This is not how you do the randomized blinded trials that I that are my stock and trade and everybody else's stock and trade in my field. Nonetheless, they worked like a son of a gun. <laughs> you you no, made me. You, you, you ma yeah, oh, sorry, John. You made me think of something that um, one of my colleagues does. 
it, it, that's not what, she, what he does, but it's something similar. You made me think of Phil Wakenell, one of my colleagues, when he talks about one of the things you say, the idea of doing something after, let's say, 10 minutes to buy the audience's attention back, he uses the analogy of the sand in an hourglass. And he yeah. says that the sand in an hourglass runs out after a few minutes, but it's very easy to just flip you over and start again. Very nice. and, and with the audience, it's the same thing. You can flip you over and start again. Yeah. And when he talks about that, when he uses the analogy, he brings an actual hourglass with him and he shows the hourglass. Yeah. So it's, it, Instead of using just a, a slide with some bullet points, boring again, talking about the no, you use an analogy which is narrative, and then I also show you something, and it's a it's a, a little attempt to to create a more of a multi sensory experience, I guess. Sure. No? Well, for sure, or at least uh, in in infuse a narrative. In the case where you only can do auditory and visual, there are some things you can do. Um, I was a professional animator and a graphics artist before I was a scientist, and I had to make a decision at some point early in my life, which I wanted to do. So I still kept up with the animation a little bit, so I animate the slides on, on lecture. One of the things you can show that you can be not sneaky with, but if you have to use slides, and sometimes you just do, never make a slide unless it's got a moving object on it. Mm. That's a Medina rule. Maybe it's because I have a it's just a slight bias, but the uh, uh, but what you can show is that if something is moving, your brain will lock down onto it. And this makes perfect sense from the Serengeti because the things that usually could kill us were not trees that moved towards us. It was leopards we couldn't see until, the, until we were ambushed by them from moving. So we were trained. There's whole areas in the brain that are devoted simply to looking at, we talked about motion once, but to ask questions, is something moving? The most uh, robust attention getting uh, uh, visual device is a rotating three dimensional moving object. That's the thing we pay the most attention to. So when you go to a 3D movie and the thing pops out on the screen, you'll watch everybody. No one's looking at the background. Everybody's looking at the thing popped out onto the screen because they can see it. Well. We pay attention to visual objects, moving visual objects with such robustness that there's actually a principle. It's called the pictorial superiority effect. We talk about that in brain rules. The, uh, uh, the more visual you can make uh, something, the more likely it is to be remembered. And by the way, if you wanna do repetition, we tend to remember those better uh, than not. So if you wanna bring up a repetition, make sure you bring up a, a, a rule with it. Mostly because, and here's a really good point to stress, we can't do multi-sensory environments with the current technology very well. If I, I don't even know the class that came in after me smelled for the next three hours brute perfume, and I'm sure they wondered what the, I didn't have any evacuating fans or anything like that. You could know, move the thing out of the way. So I don't know how you'd, how you'd put smell o vision inside a classroom. It doesn't mean the principle isn't sound. It's extraordinarily sound. Its implementation is where the, is the devil in the details yeah. but but visual you, you talked about pictorial superiority effect mm -hmm. in the book there is an interesting piece of data you say that if you give a an oral presentation or a text-based presentation then i think it was three days after that presentation it was shown that the audience will remember no more than 10 percent of what you told them whereas if you add a picture if you present your information in a more visual way your audience's retention will go up to 65 percent again three days later I'm, I'm just curious, where does that come from, from, um, from a research or, or, or scientific perspective? Well, what was being measured was something called recognition memory. So it's, have I seen it before? And if you just were presented with the text string uh, uh, versus the picture, you saw, you remembered the picture better, hence the idea of pictorial superiority effect. And what they were doing is that they were using text string as a control. But text strings all by themselves, I have usually tell people that thou shalt limit your text on a slide to no more than 150 letters tops, if that, unless you can make it move. <laughs> <laughs> then, then you could be a little more forgiving with it. But there's a really fast, this is Deb, Debbie Moore's work, I think at the University of Leeds, the, uh, is where she did her work originally. She asked the question, you know, if you're seeing a word, shouldn't you after a while, if we get used to the word the in, in English, we see that word all the time, 
wouldn't it make sense for the brain to just to adapt to it so that's no longer looking at each individual letter, T-H-E, but rather looking at just a, maybe a, a, a physical representation of the word, sees it and then moves on. Brain loves to do that. I mean, it will, it will uh, produce, like I like to call them mini batch files for people that remember DOS program. Man, does that show my age? I can't say that to audiences younger than 40, by the way. <laughs> I know, I know DOS, I know DOS. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, batch file, all right? The, uh, uh, um, no, what she was able to show is it doesn't matter how familiar with the letter, your brain has to inspect every freaking little letter that's in a word. As a result, it doesn't see a letter as a letter per se. It sees a letter as just another graphic. And so the more graphics you put on the screen, in this case, it's going to be words, the more you are taxing the brain to try and process the information. Whereas if you see a big circle, which can be big and giant, and maybe it's glistening and rotating all around, you'll see that all at once. You don't look at the circle and then read from right to left and then finally get the whole circle. No, you can behold the whole thing at once, the, uh, as opposed to a letter where you have to go individually. The more text you put onto a slide, the more work you make the brain do. And the, you also then trigger out something else, which I'm not sure was in, the, in Brain Rules or not. I think it's in the, the more recent version. Uh, if I say the word saccade and fixation point, do you know what I mean by that? This might be worth uh, going through because what the, the bottom line here, the 40,000 foot view is, uh, here's a reason why you should have limit the amount of text on a slide to keep the pictorial superiority effect uh, large. Okay, when you're reading through a text string and you put eye tracking software so that you can actually measure where the brain is locking down on, you'd think that it would be like uh, uh, like an old typewriter. Bing, bing. Talk to, right? You just a nice linear presentation. That's not what the eye does. You know what the eye does? The eye will look at the first word and a couple of letters in there and then jump like eight words and then look over at that word for a little bit and then go back maybe four words and look back at that and then go. The eye looks like, if you do the tracing, it looks like it's drunk. <laughs> Those jumps are called saccades or saccades, S A C C A D, uh, saccades, uh, and they jump. Uh, not only do they jump forward, they also jump backwards. And when they jump backwards, it's called a regressive saccade. When you are busy jumping, you're not remembering, perceiving anything. It's only when the brain lands on a spot for a few seconds, uh, a few, actually, a few milliseconds, uh, it's called a fixation point. Does the perception actually occur? So if you are going to have a whole text string out there, you're going to have to know that your audience is going to behave like they're drunk, looking at all the text. Together. The net vector, if it's a big paragraph, will actually go down to the end, which is why you can read a paragraph. But it's not because you read a paragraph like it was a nice linear uh, uh, typewriter. In fact, it's a cop. Because there is so much work the brain has to do to read text, it's another reason why you really need to limit it. You know, one way I get around if I need to have some text sometimes to, to give it a narrative form, I will actually, I'll put up a, a picture, say it's, say it's, maybe it's Alan Badley, Alan Badley's work. I'll put up a picture of Alan, if I can get his permission. And then I will put a little cartoon bubble comic, you know, like the little cart comic bubbles that you see and put the quote right in there, if it's a longer quote, so that it looks like Alan's speaking the word in a comic book setting. So you're captured, you're still got text and there may be just, a, you may have approached your 150 word limit there, but you make it gentler on the audience so that they stay with you and they are not exhausted by what it is that you say. Yeah, you make it more visual. Yeah. Making oh, it a narrative too, because the person is speaking. Oh, that person is speaking, so there's a narrative feel too. Yeah. A narrative too, connecting the dots. No, no. And okay, so I do have, we've got maybe about 10, 15 minutes left. So we've covered a lot of things already. Attention, memory. We talked about the sight vision being one of the dominant senses, stimulating more of the senses, creating multisensory presentations or, or lectures. Now, I do have some other, um, let's say, random questions that are interesting that I, I, I've learned from you. And one, I think, is very much connected to public speaking. Now, in Brain Rules, you talk about stress. And you say that unless the stress is very severe, so that would be another, I guess, another story. But if it's not too severe then the brain performs better when it is stressed than compared to when it's not stressed. So 
I'll, I'll try and, and make another logical connection, although please tell me if that's not the case because you are the scientist, yeah. Can we say that, again, unless the stress is too severe, but if it's not too severe, if somebody feels a bit stressed before a presentation or before giving a lecture, mm -hmm. can we say that in terms of how the brain performs, that's not necessarily a bad thing? Um, yes, you can. You could say that. Uh, the, way, the reason why we can say that is from an old curve called the Yerkes curve, Y-E-R-K-E-S. Uh, it was an older, almost anecdotal, but it's actually been redone in recent years, and you still see the same thing. The Yerkes curve is like an inverted uh, U. Uh, there is a certain amount of stress. The more stress you get, the better your performance is. So stress would be on the uh, uh, y-axis and the uh, uh, performance is on the x. For, for, there's, there's, there's a certain amount of performance that you can actually get, but there comes a time when the Yerkes curve peaks because it's an inverted U. And then the more stress you get, the less learning occurs. So it's a Goldilocks, classic Goldilocks effect. You have to get the sweet spot. Mm -hmm. The sweet spot is different for different people, but there is a hint as to what we can say about the, what I would call you stress or good stress, the, uh, as opposed to the uh, stress that hurts. When stress hurts you, it's not because you were stressed, it's because you felt out of control of the stress. This is a very important 40,000 foot insight. It's not the aversive stimuli that actually hurts the brain. It's the inability to feel in control of the aversive stimuli that hurts the brain. If you heard a bomb going off 20 kilometers away from you, you might be in some control of that, specifically if you hear that a fair amount. Uh, but as soon as you hear it really, really close to you, you know it might get you. you, you are now out of control of it. That's when you begin to experience the stress. So for your clients that may be afraid to public speak, You've got to first, the first question you have to ask them if, in terms of dealing with stress management is, when do you begin to feel out of control? At what point do you no longer feel in control of this? Because it's, it's at that point that it's going to hurt them. If they feel excited and a little nervous and, oh, I can't wait to get out there because, gee, then I'll be the center of attention and in 10 minutes, it'll be just fine. You know, that's great. That stage fright is, can be fine. But when stage fright is catastrophic, when they feel so out of control that they feel like at any moment someone's going to jump out of their seat. And uh, uh, I don't know how Prime Minister's Questions does it because that's what's going to happen. <laughs> it gets right in there and all of a sudden people are jumping down their throat. At that point, they need to back off for a little bit and focus on that for a little while. In fact, for in terms of stress management, what I do is that I have people usually uh, rate, the, uh, list the number of things that they feel stressed over and then rate their feelings of control over it. The more out of control they feel, the worse it's going to be. And this is one of the great uh, uh, reasons why you should know as a speaker your material uh, 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 like it's the back of your hand. You should have it memorized you, if that makes you secure. So you don't have to, if you're going to be freaked out by the fact that there's an audience there, you won't be freaked out by the fact of your stumbling words because you know the words and you can at least recite them um, there. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, I agree We now. In, in my experience, John, there are two types of speakers. You have the memorizers and the improvisers, and it's a spectrum. So it's not that you are either 100% a memorizer or 100% an improviser. And I think there is no right or wrong approach. There's only the approach that works for each of us. But I agree with you 100%, especially for improvisers. You can be an improviser, but I would always encourage them to be prepared, to rehearse a number of times. And it doesn't matter if every time they repeat it out loud, every time they rehearse, they say different things. They use different words because they are improvising a little bit. But whatever they say would be much more powerful the fifth time than the first. That's for sure. The metaphor I usually use is a jazz musician. A jazz musician will have a chart a series of chord progressions or things that they want to do, and then they can improvise without the, with it. But the audience who doesn't know anything you, uh, of, of what you're about to say needs to have a structural framework that they can continually refer to. And uh, free jazz is nice, particularly if you're a performer, but audiences often get lost in free jazz that I've found. What they're more interested in is they look at Pat Metheny and he goes off with Lyle Mays for a while and they're doing something. So jazz is a conversation, but they'll come back to a structure. And Pat Metheny once said, I don't like to play with musicians who don't have the circle of fifths memorized. 
which is a very non-improvisatory thing to say, right? Yeah. Yet it provides the scaffolding upon which the improvisations can occur. You can't do it the other way. If you do, it's like playing air guitar. So there's a form of the structure, but there's no real sound coming out. You're just making things up. On the other hand, audiences don't always like to listen to a classical performance. So they don't want you just up there with your cello going. Da, 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 da. Sometimes they want to be able to improvise off it too. So both. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, John, as we are getting closer to, to the end of our conversation, let's talk about books. Now, beyond your own books, and for our listeners today, I recommend, I highly recommend all of them. So today we talked about Brain Rules, but John has recently published, I think it was last year, wasn't it? Brain Rules for Work. Right, November of 2020. Yeah, Brain Rules for Work, which if we think about what happened in the last couple of years, so that book is extremely relevant to the current situation. Also, Brain Rules for Baby, which I have to say, it's now my to-do list for reading because my wife has recently told me that I will become a father. So... Congratulations! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. My goodness gracious sakes. Thank you. Thank you. Is it a boy or a girl? Oh, not yet, because it's very early now. But then I, in preparation for this conversation, I thought about it and I said, now the next book has to be Brain Rules for Baby. And then you also have. We come back on we'll do welcome though to the hardest best thing that will have ever happened to you oh my gosh i'm excited thank you thank you very much and then you've got brain rules for aging well right yeah that's right that's right so lots of fantastic books highly recommended all of them now if you think about what we talked about today which is mainly if we want to summarize it what science tells us about what works from a communication perspective do you have any other um, books from, from somebody else, one, one book that you would recommend? Oh, I would recommend Gar Reynolds and Presentation Zen. The, uh, that is extraordinary uh, for the practical side. If you want to get into the uh, uh, neuroscience side, somebody that's publishing or that has published lay audiences, but is a real live great neuroscientist, anything by a guy named Joseph Ledoux, and I'll spell that, L-E-D-O-U-X. He has done a lot of great work about, uh, uh, oh man, there's so many different things, but one of them is that he's looked at fear responses a lot and he's, and he's, he's an articulate speaker, for uh, uh, an articulate writer. I would also recommend, if you just want the gee whiz of things, I would recommend two books. One of them is The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, the very famous work by Oliver Sacks. And yes, there's a man who has a stroke that no longer could identify objects. He couldn't, so he was just as likely to grab his wife's face and try to put it on his head <laughs> thinking that, oh, she has a face. Their hats are usually on faces. Oh, I'll just grab this face and, and put it on mine. So he lost object identification. And a one by Ramachandran called Phantoms in the Brain, who did a tremendous amount of work with uh, stroke patients and the phantom limbs and a lot of different things. If you want the gee whiz sides of that, I would recommend that as a uh, ECS, emotionally competent, something you would do every 10 minutes, but for the for the uh, bulk of it, I'd do the Joseph Ledoux and Gar Reynolds. Thank you very much. And Gar, as I told you before, before we, we start your conversation, that book also was super important for me. When I read that book, it, it opened my eyes to what really means to create and deliver powerful presentations. It also made me understand that most business presentations suck. So for me, my journey to trying to become the best presenter I could be started with presentations and by, by Gary Reynolds. So thank you for that. And before, before we close, so if people want to connect with you or, or find you online, where, where do they find you? Brainrules.net will give you most all of the books and references. And by the way, most every sentence, certainly every sentence in this, in our conversation here has a reference to it because it's evidence-based and I tend to go with the peer review. There's so much we don't know about how the brain works and there are so many mythologies out there. Like you may have heard that you only use 10% of your brain or that there is a left brain and a right brain personality. 
you, you know all that's nonsense? <laughs> it's just mythologies. <laughs> so what I do provide for each of the books are the references, so you can go look those things up for yourself. And they're really extensive. In my world, these would be called giant review articles. Those are all on brainrules.net to answer the question. So you can go there and get the references. There's animations and there's, uh, and I think you can buy the books there too. I, I don't supervise it, so I have a day job. <laughs> <laughs> brainrules.net. And that's why I love that book and everything you work because it's of course it's science-based it tells us and it shows what science tells us about what works what doesn't work from a communication perspective is there anything else any final messages that you like to or final thoughts you like to share with our audience today anything at all any asks that you have for audience a question that you would have loved for me to ask and i didn't do it anything at all you like to share before we close well, one thing we should probably talk about, maybe if we, if we have another conversation, perhaps when you have your child, this will be really good. We should probably talk about sleep <laughs> and learning. There is a great deal that can be understood by harnessing the great power of sleep. For example, a, present, a presenter who is busy trying to memorize a presentation, one of the best things they could do is to just read through part of the presentation that they want to have memorized right before they go to bed. Because at night, the brain actually lights up and starts repeating things that it experienced during the day over and over and over again. Most It's called offline processing. And the guy who most responsible for this is Robert Stickgold. He's also at Harvard. The uh, Robert Stickgold was able to show the brain is really active at night. And people that need to memorize parts of their speech or just need to have a, a corpus of knowledge that they don't know about and need to get a better understanding, one of the best things they can do is to uh, read it just before they go to bed. And when they wake up, read it again. This is so interesting, and it's something that my mom, as a kid, used to tell me in preparation for tests, exams. That's what she suggested that I did. Uh -huh. I, I just thought that it's one of these things that your mom tells you, and it's so nice to know that it's actually science-based. She oh, doesn't know. But... Well, there's an experiment you can do. They took a bunch of, uh, I'm not sure if it was math graduate students or somebody, and asked them, they gave them eight hours to work on a series of problems, uh, and they gave them the bonehead way to do the problem. Unbeknownst to them, there was a beautiful, elegant way to solve these math problems, but they didn't tell them the elegant way. They just gave them the bonehead way. But the test was to see how many would spontaneously discover it on their own. And almost three times as many students could discover it on their own if in that eight hours, a bunch of a bunch of those hours were spent sleeping. No kidding. Wow. They processed it over and over in their brain. So it isn't good just for memorizing things. It's also good for processing the things that happen to you. So maybe in another conversation. Exactly. So that, that would be part two of our podcast with Dr. John Medina. John, thank you very much again. It's been a real pleasure. It's been fun. It's been an honor for me to have this opportunity. I really appreciate you taking the time, sharing your insights. Thank you very much again. Let's keep in touch and keep up the excellent work you're doing. Well, thank you for your kind words, the invitation, and congratulations, Andrea. The best job ahead of you is just ahead of you. <laughs> thank you very much, John. Cheers. Okay, bye-bye. If you enjoyed this episode of the Ideas on Stage podcast, there are many more you might like. So please subscribe, leave us a review, and tell us what you think. You can find many more ideas on business communication at ideasonstage.com or by searching for Ideas on Stage on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening, and goodbye for now.